Welcome. In this short video, we're going to take a look at how fiscal and monetary policy are going to work in an aggregate demand and aggregate supply model. In particular, we're going to look at recessionary and expansionary gaps and see how fiscal and monetary policy can be used to close those gaps. We'll look at the impact of fiscal policy and then we'll look at the impact of monetary policy. So let's start with fiscal policy. So as a reminder, the fiscal policy here is going to originate with the President and Congress in the United States. And fiscal policy has the ability to shift aggregate demand in our model. And that's how we're going to close these gaps. And we can shift aggregate demand with fiscal policy by changing taxes or transfer payments or by changing the amount of government purchases. So let's start with an expansionary fiscal policy. So expansionary fiscal policy would be designed to expand the economy, or in other words, it's going to shift aggregate demand to the right. So it's going to be used during a recessionary gap. So expansionary fiscal policy involves a tax cut or a spending increase, and the result would shift aggregate demand to the right. And we believe that will happen in our model because it could shift uh, government purchases, capital G here, which is a component of aggregate demand, it also could affect consumer spending. If we cut taxes, consumers have more disposable income, they're going to spend more. So expansionary fiscal policy would close a recessionary gap. So let's see a picture of this. So let's begin with the recessionary gap. So the recessionary gap means we have a short run equilibrium below potential output. So in order to get us back to potential output, an expansionary fiscal policy, a tax cut, a spending increase, would shift aggregate demand to the right towards a long-run equilibrium. And as a result, we have a higher price level and a higher GDP at potential output. Contractionary fiscal policy would move us in the other direction. We would raise taxes or cut spending to shift aggregate demand to the left and to close an expansionary or an inflationary gap. So let's draw our expansionary gap right here. So we have a short run equilibrium that exceeds potential output. The contractionary fiscal policy, we shift aggregate demand to the left and we return to long run equilibrium. And as a result, we would see a lower price level and a lower GDP a potential output. Problems. It sounds like really easy, doesn't it? Well, when we look at the graph, everything might not be that easy. For, for once, how long does it take for aggregate demand to shift? These are, this is a problem with what we call policy lags. And, and fiscal policy has some pretty long lags. So with a policy lag, the President and Congress have to recognize the problem in the economy. They have to agree on a policy to address it. They have to implement the policy. Congress has to vote. The president has to sign it. And then the policy will take some time to work. And all of that could easily take over a year, after which time the economy could have changed. Another problem with fiscal policy is called crowding out. And this is the concern that if the government borrows money to finance an increase in spending, they're going to push up the interest rates for everybody. And higher interest rates would discourage private investment. So what happens is the government comes in to borrow and spend, and they push out private investment, and so the spending might not be as expansionary as they hoped. So both of these problems, policy lags crowding out, suggest that the real-life um, issue of enacting fiscal policy isn't as simple as it's going to look in that graph. Now let's turn to monetary policy. Monetary policy is really going to work the same way in an aggregate demand, aggregate supply model. It's going to work on the aggregate demand curve. Monetary policy is the domain of the Federal Reserve System in the United States. In other words, the United States Central Bank. And we're going to shift the aggregate demand curve, and there's several tools in the Federal Reserve's toolkit. Open market operations is the most common way, so the buying and selling of Treasury debt. The Federal Reserve can also change its discount rate that it lends to other banks, or the reserve requirement on other banks. And then more, more recent history, uh, after the t in the 2007-2009 recession, a lot of these things weren't enough, and the Federal Reserve has done some quantitative easing to go above and beyond um, their toolkit for monetary policy. And I have a star here with open market operations and quantitative easing. 
um, because those are really what's more commonly used in monetary policy. These two tools in the middle aren't really practical for monetary policy. So with monetary policy, changes in the money supply using these tools mean a change in the interest rates in the economy, which affects spending decisions. Lower and higher interest rates affect decisions from home buyers, people want to buy a car, firms that want to borrow money or issue bonds to expand production, all of those things. And those changes can shift aggregate demand. And this chain of events is known as the transmission channel of monetary policy. So monetary policy kind of works indirectly into the aggregate demand curve by changing really the cost of financing the spending on goods and services in the U.S. economy. So expansionary monetary policy by the Fed, our shorthand for the Federal Reserve, would be an open market purchase, a lower discount rate, or a lower reserve requirement. All of these would be a type of expansionary monetary policy. The end result would be to make interest rates fall, which encourages spending, and causes aggregate demand to shift right. So expansionary monetary policy would be something the Federal Reserve does to close a recessionary gap. So to close this recessionary gap, here's our recessionary gap, and you know, can see here at this level, expansionary monetary policy looks the same in this graph. It's a shift to the right in aggregate demand towards long-run equilibrium. How that happens is where the difference is. Contractionary monetary policy, opposite direction. We got, do an open market sale, higher discount rates, higher reserve requirements. All of those would push interest rates higher, discourage spending, and shift aggregate demand to the left. So contractionary monetary policy would be used to close an expansionary gap. In other words, put the brakes on an economy that's overheating. There's our expansionary gap. Contractionary monetary policy shifts aggregate demand to the left for a new equilibrium at potential output. In the long run, output would be a potential, and so if an economy is in long run equilibrium already, monetary or fiscal policy only affects the price level in the long run. And to see why, see our picture, we have potential output, the long run aggregate supply curve, shifts in aggregate demand only affect the price level. They don't affect real GDP in the long run, because the long run aggregate supply curve is vertical. So really, monetary and fiscal policy would be useful for closing these short run gaps, but we wouldn't expect them to have an impact in the long run. Now, why use monetary and fiscal policy? Why not wait for self-correction? Well, that debate is referred to as an active versus passive policy debate. People who advocate for active policy advocate for using monetary or fiscal policy to shift aggregate demand. And they advocate that because they argue that self-correction sounds great in theory, but in fact it works too slowly. Uh, wages and prices aren't, aren't flexible enough and people are suffering while you wait for an economy to self-correct and the government can maybe do it faster. The problems with an active policy were the policy lags that we talked about earlier. Monetary policy has a shorter policy lag. The Federal Reserve can act more quickly, but there's still a policy lag. There's also measurement issues. To know what kind of policy, fiscal policy, we should enact and, and how big it should be, we have to know where the economy is with a great degree of accuracy. How big is the gap? and how big of a tax cut do we need to close this gap, for example. Those are not trivial issues. Now, those who advocate a passive policy think that we should stand back and wait for the economy to self-correct. They argue that this, because of measurement and lags that the government would really cause more problems than it solves. So passive policy would say wait for a short one average supply shifts to sh close the gap. And so again, they would, they would cite all the problems with active policy we just talked about, and they would say these problems are kind of insurmountable. They also believe that the economy just quickly. So they also believe in creating this environment that would give wage and price flexibility so that self-correction could happen relatively quickly. Again, the problem with passive policy is if, in fact, formal and informal institutions in an economy make wages and prices sticky, then self-correction may not work. Uh, John Maynard Keynes, famous economist in the Great Depression, was quoted as saying, in the long run, we are all dead. And really what he's referring to is you can wait for an economy to correct in the long run, but in the meantime, people are really suffering, and maybe the government should try and help them with their active policy 
even though it might not be perfect.